Thank you, gentlemen. <coughs> uh, you know, we'll start with a quick round of introductions. As uh, you know, you know, I'm Ashish Tulsi, and I'm the founder at RestroWorks. We are a restaurant tech company. Work with some 22,000 restaurants spread across 52 countries. I've been a restaurateur myself. Uh, fell into the restaurant industry by mistake, <laughs> thinking that it's a cool idea. It That's wasn't. That's how it is for everybody, right? Uh, 13 years back, and to fix my own mistake, I said, "Okay, we'll we'll build some tech." Uh, instead of being a bad restaurant here. So I, I got bailed out, but these men here, you know, were not as lucky, or maybe they were. <laughs> so we'd like to know, you know, Matthew, uh, Eunice, and Sharif, if you can introduce yourself, what you guys do, like quick 10 seconds. Go ahead, Sharif. All right, I'm um, 30 years of experience in uh, QSR and casual dining. Uh, managed around 15 franchises around the world in the MENA region. Uh, currently working in the Aulayang Group, uh, managing their restaurants portfolio. Hello, everyone. My name is Faisal uh, Yunus. I'm the CEO, FMB CEO of Sinomi Retail, one of the biggest retailers here in Saudi Arabia. We have uh, more than 500 branches across Saudi, and uh, we focus predominantly on the QSR concepts. Fabulous. My name is Matteo Ramos. I've been in the restaurant business for 30 years. I'm a second generation restaurateur from Seattle, Washington. I've had under my, pur my purview here in the Middle East over 400 restaurants across all of the GCC and MENA. I'm happy to be with you and let's have some fun. Perfect. Uh, so gentlemen, bottom line efficiency at scale. One of the uh, most painful and scary problems uh, or, or the only challenge that restaurant industry is dealing with. I would like to you know, st shoot straight with where the bottom line is. Pilferage wastage, your efficiency at the raw material level, which is the biggest cost center and the most visible cost center. And I, you know, with my experience, I've seen that operators, I will not say go wrong with it, but I have rarely seen, you know, them going right with it all the time. There's always dissonance between what is ideal, what is tolerable, and then what happens you know, actually on the ground. Matteo, why don't we start with you? What's happening with the pilferage, wastage, efficiency of the raw material, and how do you look at it from a prescribed ideal to what's real percentages? Just to start off, ideally, um, traditionally that number's been 0.8% of sales, the combined shrinkage and wastage. Um, Technology has allowed us, us to shrink that quite a bit. And then it also, it also varies across brands. So in my coffee business, when we're talking about the pure beverage cost, there's almost no variance to standard because it's all me mechanized, it's all automated. So you're only gonna get wastage in, in certain circumstances. In the actual food preparation business, in QSR business, uh, in businesses like, um, like fast food burgers where you're gonna have products in the PHU, you're gonna have a higher, higher variance level. And that's gonna go up to about 0.5 depending on how much volume you have in a unit. The unit dictates how much waste is, how much product you can hold in PHUs. And there's an inverse correlation between um, volume and, uh, and the, the, the lessening of the, of the wastage. Now the key thing here to remember when I, when I talk about this is when you're looking at numbers, be careful how you manage this number. You know, I've been in, in organizations that are very, very large. And when you're pointing to the team and saying, I want this number at this level, I want 0 0.4, 0 0.4, you're going to get that number, but you're going to get it through behaviors that you do not actually, actually want. The key thing when you're driving this number is using the technology and the numbers to help you assist and help you assess how your behaviors are correlating and actually being messaged to the team. You want to get the correct behaviors, not just the correct number. It's a huge aspect of our business. And when you do push just getting the number and not looking at the operational behaviors and the operational standards that are driving that number, you're going to get a lot of behaviors and a lot of cultural issues that you don't want to have in your organization. Can you, can you give me some anecdote? Oh, definitely. Um, so, for example, when, when I was first getting into um, fast food, I was working in the United States in the Burger King company, and the, the person in charge at the time of company operations like, we want this number like this, we want it like this. There was no effort put into actually teaching the behaviors that drive the number correctly. <laughs> So what you get is you get team members, you get, you get managers padding inventory, you get, you get team members overholding food in the PHUs, which causes product and quality issues. But most importantly, when you actually go down that path of just driving a result but not doing it the right way, you impart cultural issues into your organization, and then you have a real problem. That's much harder to fix than a shrinkage or a wastage issue. 
you know, it's, um, you know, you drive a business which is the product, you know, one of the product lines, let's say Subway, as yeah. an example, uh, there's too much customization that is possible. That's the business. How do you look at this wastage? What's, what's, what are the tolerance lines and what happens in real? Sure. Uh, on a high level, to start with, Ashish, there is no one-size-fits-all target across. It depends on many factors. Some of the factors could be the segment you're in. Your, your wastage at the fine dining level is completely different than your wastage target at the QSR, casual dining, fast casual. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one. Two, it also depends on your operational practices. Uh, on the QSR level, uh, we focus, our targets are usually 1.5% and below. We target a 1.5% wastage. Why? Because we, we're at scale. If you look at Subway, we have more than 200 locations today, Cinnamon more than 200. So we're quite scalable concept. We have standardized uh, menu. But the, the, the best practice would be as follows. It's so important to really communicate those targets to each and every store that you operate. Every store manager, every employee that works in our restaurants has to know the targets that we've put for the wastage. Obviously, they have to be well trained. Uh, they have to have the right practices in place. But communication on these targets is so important. So again, just to summarize it, on a QSR, it's usually between 1.5% and below. But within your, within your concepts, you also run Cinnabon. Correct. How does this percentage vary? And, you know, can you also share what happens when there is a bad store? Like, what does a bad store mean? Is it 8%, 5%, 3%? What are those, what are those variations? Yeah. I mean, th that's a good point you mentioned because Subway and Cinnamon are completely to, are within the QSR segment, yet they have different targets. Why? Because Subway uses fresh ingredients. Cinnabon, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that Cinnabon doesn't use uh, fresh <laughs> ingredients, <laughs> but on the contrary, it has more standardized uh, menu. So we allow more uh, wastages for Subway compared to, to Cinnabon because the fact that it's, it's, a, it's a, a fresh uh, ingredient uh, process. So, so again, depending on the subcategory, this is where you have to be. Uh, to answer your, your, your last question about what could get worse, I, I can tell you we have stores with 5-6% uh, wastages, which we're hardly looking at, and some stores which very, very low wastage, which we get worried about because you need to have wastage. In our business, mm -hmm. wastage is so important to have, yet it has to be controlled. But then what, what happens with a 5-6%? And I'm speaking from an operator's lens that, you know, if a store is doing a 5-6%, as an operator, what's the remedy? What is, it that you, what is it that you do? Your system flags it to start with. If you have proper inventory management systems, you immediately has it, have it flagged. The team, the area manager, the operations manager will immediately jump in to understand the, and investigate the issue of why the wastage went up to 4 or 5% versus vis-a-vis -a, -vis a target of, let's say, 1.5%. One one, 1 Usually, it's carelessness from uh, following the recipes, not properly following the recipe. So we saw some theft sometimes, privilege from your, your side, and we took immediate action. We, take, we usually take immediate action to uh, correct it. Correct the behavior. Sheriff, we, we were talking about this, uh, you know, before. What's your view on the tolerance of uh, wastage as well as pilferage, what's, what's the real, what's, what's uh, prescribed? Today with the technology being there, it made our life much easier. I started my career when there was no technology in this area and we used to do it by hand. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, it's a triangle of fair to employees, fair to the company bottom line, and customer service as well. Because we don't want the employees to start taking over care on the products and giving the wrong quality to the consumer. And we don't want to be unfair, and we don't want to be not being fair to our staff if they actually exceed what the limits are. Uh, in my system today, we don't have tolerance. We have everything very clear in front of us. So we have a theoretical usage based on updated recipes all the time that is computer generated based on the sales. So each restaurant can have a different uh, numbers to look at. And then after that, we have, we have the clear wastage. And again, wastage depends on the product mix, menu mix, and the area where the store is. So again, even on wastages, we have differences, but it is very clearly calculated based on historical data and a little bit of influence from the marketing department as well based on the campaigns that are running. So as of tolerance, no, we have zero tolerance policy when it comes to this area because of the technology. 
and because of being able to see everything. The only key here is how far as a company we can make sure that everything that is going into the calculation has been updated and is there because otherwise it becomes an unfair system. If, if you can reach this equation, then it becomes, uh, we reach zero tolerance in this case. So what about, what about pilferages? Like, you know, as Yunus said, theft is also one reality that restaurant industry has. What, what is your experience and view on? With, with, with zero tolerance, you literally get rid of all of this because simply we have analysis that comes every month. Restaurant managers looks at it. If you have a justification, he gives it to the company. We have a special cost control department that is handling this only. And if the custom, if the if the restaurant manager has justification, then well, we'll study it and we'll look into it and we'll give him whatever it takes. But if there is no justification for anything that disappeared from the store, he will pay for it straightforward. Him, 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 and his team. But we're very, very clear on this. And over the years, it has tested to be very straightforward and it makes everybody happy. So, so your bad stores are also at an ideal wastage. Is that so? Uh, unless the restaurant manager is paying the difference. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think, and, and I, I'm asking that because, you know, as an operator, I've also seen, you know, as, uh, as Matteo said, that when you give staff a certain number to chase, mm -hmm. uh, you are going to get the number. Mm -hmm. They're going to hit the number. And uh, I have personally seen that they have hit the number so enthusiastically <laughs> that actually got positive variance. <laughs> that means we had, you know, almost 120% yield on the raw material, which simply meant yeah. that customers are actually losing Correct. on the product being promised. Yeah, we, we worry from positive more than negative because when they hit positive yields, this means that the consumer is being affected, which is hurting the quality or the consumer journey. And in this, yeah, we, we, this becomes a bigger problem. So for us as a system, positive is more uh, dangerous for us than negative actually. Yeah, so, so all kinds of efficiencies are not great efficiencies. Right. But on that note, you know, one of the biggest, uh, I should not say problems, I think whether it's a boon or bane we'll, we'll discuss is the aggregator business. Delivery business has picked up over last half a decade in the world. And I think this is one problem where I see world is really, really flat. Um, COVID flattened it further. Aggregator business created a very, like it took a big bite from the revenues, from the margins that restaurant industry used to uh, enjoy uh, at a gross margin level. But then I can also see that there is a percentage in different markets that drives that prosperity. What's the percentage of your delivery business? What's the dine-in? What's takeaway, drive-through? And each is carrying a different margin profile today. I see operators all across the world continuously talking and wondering about what's that ratio where you can have a fledging delivery business without really hurting the margins of a particular store and they want to top it up with either drive-throughs or dine-in. What's happening in your world? We can, we can start with you and then come to Matthew. Uh, aggregators is becoming a pain point in our industry at this time. And having the right percentage is very difficult because it's very from a culture to culture, from country to country. We are operating in multiple countries and we see that in some countries delivery can be 20, 22%, up to 50 and 60% in some other markets. Uh, so I, I will not say that there is a right percentage uh, that you are about to. It would be great if it does not go above 30 or 35 percent, but it is a fact of life. This is a consumer habit of using the businesses. This is a consumer culture. Uh, and to be honest, it's becoming the most relevant and the most easy way uh, to, to, to get food quickly and conveniently. You don't have to suffer through uh, driving, you don't have to suffer through going any place. Uh, you sit in front of your Netflix, you sit in front of, in your own room, on your own dining area, in your own office, and you have a quick bite. It's becoming very, very convenient. Um, so it is, it is a major challenge. Uh, but I think companies, especially QSRs, have to try to maintain, based on each market, the right percentage and not to leave sometimes the choice 
to the management team of the brand to start running with delivery in order to make up for other failures in their system because this is not the best way to do it, to be honest. What's that percentage for you? You said 30, 35 for aggregators should be like your top. For the whole delivery, including the aggregator. And what are you experiencing with respect to takeaway and dine-in as of today? Um, you have to add to the takeaway the drive-through as well because it is uh, part of the proposition. Drive-through automatically formulates 30% uh, of the business. Uh, end of the day, in order for the brand to grow and survive, you have to maintain uh, a percentage of each. You need to invest in your restaurants to be uh, appetizing and to be inviting for restaurants to come in. And takeaway and drive through is just the convenient way. So this comes on top, uh, on site of the equation. But I think delivery, dine in, and any out, uh, out of restaurant uh, food category can come. So delivery usually, sorry, drive through is usually around 30, 35% of the business. And then the remaining will be in between takeaway and uh, uh, dine in. Uh, you know, so well, if you had asked me this question pre-COVID, my answer would have been completely different than today. Pre-COVID, dine-in was the dominant, had more weight in terms of revenue growth than today. Post-COVID, things have changed, to your point, uh, Ashish. Uh, obviously, the third-party delivery have mushroomed, and we're seeing a wave. Now, there's no, again, there's no one-size-fits-all when it comes to ratios. It depends on many factors. One, it depends on the segment. QSR, fast casual, it depends on the brand itself, the cuisine, it depends on the store, it depends on the demographics, it depends on the market, even some markets are more mature when it comes to delivery vis-a-vis -vis some other uh, market. Uh, when it comes to QSR and the brands that we operate, I see the following split, today we're seeing a 45, 35, 20, 45 delivery, food delivery, 35 takeaway, 20% dine-in. Now, this has also led us to look at our future, uh, our future stores. We're building our future Cinnabon, our future Subway, and the future QSR brands, taking into consideration this split going forward, meaning smaller than, much mo smaller dining area, a more hands-on delivery, uh, drive-through, sorry, experience, and a hands-on delivery uh, ex uh, experience, because we see this wave continuing for the, for the following uh, years. Given... Um Given aggregator business and special delivery business, 45% is you know, way above the red flag, or red mark that uh, Sheriff feels in his side of the business. What did you do or did you do something to get your bottom line efficiency in place? Yeah. And, because, and because aggregators are charging a percentage from your order. Correct. That means if your top line grows, your aggregator margin uh, you know, that they take away also grows with it. So you technically have no chill. In yeah. fact, I believe at a larger top line, your management cost, your, you know, your wastages, etc., may increase, may have like a bigger dollar impact. What is it that you are doing or have done to mitigate that? I mean, we say today that delivery is a necessity evil. You need to have it w within your uh, portfolio in terms of uh, revenue growth. What we've done is, I'll give you one of our brands, we, three years ago, we were uh, delivery used to contribute to 15%. Today is 45%. Uh, another brand, 15. we've also 15 to 45%. And there is a misconception that the more we grow delivery, the more it's going to kill the bottom line. On the contrary, what we're seeing is the more you scale your delivery, the more you create efficiencies on your on your bottom line. Uh, I'm not saying that your delivery economics are more attractive than your dine-in economics. No. But I'm saying that delivery is still profitable, high single digit or low double digit profitability vis-a-vis -vis, uh, some other uh, revenue growth. So delivery in our company, uh, food delivery, is uh, profitable and we're, we're growing it. We're consolidating our brands together. We're looking for perfect ter uh, solid terms with the aggregators. Once, once you consolidate the brands, you go to aggregators and you impose uh, terms to get lower commissions. And we have this mindset within our team that delivery is, will be the next three years uh, revenue growth uh, weight. I'm going to quote you globally on this because <laughs> very few operators can actually say that eloquently that delivery is profitable for us, but, but, that, but that's great. Uh, just quickly, we have a PNL for delivery. 
and we have the PNL for Dynan. When you look at the your P delivery PNL, you see a lot of things that you, you do not manage your PNL as as a single brand. Mm. Divide it into your delivery uh, revenue stream and your Dynan revenue stream, and you're going to see a lot of things that usually you don't see. That's a great one, Matteo. About you. Uh, well, great question. The association between delivery percentage ideal and um, for, for brands, like, like Eunice said, there's a difference in, in like, for example, fine dining, you're not going to have a lot of delivery. So let's just say we're going to go for your traditional Applebee's, IHOP, Chili's, um, casual dining brand. Y the delivery percentage varies uh, inversely to the size of your unit. So the smaller unit you have, typically you're looking for a 50 to 45 percent delivery percentage. And it seems like that's what he's targeting. But he's going about it the backwards way. He's like trying to catch up to the trend. But you got to get ahead of the trend. So when you're at, at a full service Chili's, let's say it's 4,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet, you're about 25%. You go above that, you're going to have too much, um, too much cannibalism from your dining customer where your where your bread and butter is. Now, to go to the to the main question there is what do you do with the aggregator issue? And and it is eating into margins, and that is the topic of the discussion: is how do you manage bottom line efficiency? You got to look at this thing as time and space. Like you have your space and you also have time. So we have multiple brands, we've created brands, we've created cloud kitchens. We have our traditional restaurants and when those restaurants are closed, we operate our cloud kitchens out of those restaurants. So what we're trying to do is, is combine brands, use the same kitchen, and then when the brands close down at different parts of the day, our, our, our dark brands, our dark kitchen brands, come out of those kitchens as well. So we'll try to get 24 hour, 24 hour, 24 hour out of operation out of one kitchen, which in itself is actually serving three different brands physically. And so this is something we've been moving forward to in the last four years. Um, COVID was really an inspiration to really get to that level. Um, so, and you don't have to say, for example, I have a brand and now I'm serving breakfast. Create a separate mm -hmm. brand, eggs and yolk, whatever you want to call it, running out of that kitchen from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. And then at 10 a.m., you turn off the aggregator and you start running your normal operation for the brand that the actual kitchen is in. I understand about, I, I, I get your point about mm -hmm. space efficiency. My question, you know, largely is around the brand that you're running right now. Mm -hmm. Like at mm -hmm. a certain brand level, mm -hmm. what is the percentage that you are experiencing and what you, do you think should be an ideal percentage where you're able to reach your customers through various ways, mm -hmm. but you're also, you know, not bleeding at the bottom line? Uh, you gotta let's, let's pick your coffee business. Okay, so with, with Caribou, um, again, inverse on the size of the kitchen. So if you have a 200 square meter caribou, you're not going to want delivery to be more than 35%. If you have more than 35% out of that caribou at 200 square meter, you're going to be, you, you've wasted the space because 200 square meter is huge for a coffee shop. Now, if I have 80 square meter, if I have a, a really small inline shop, maybe with a little drive through, and then I'm doing 20, 30, 40, probably 40% in drive through, 40% in delivery and 20% in dining, that would be ideal. So again, the size of the unit you have has a different requirement for delivery, drive through to be effective. And all of that has to be flushed out in the feasibility stage. You look at the stores that are covering the territory where you're planning to deliver to. I've seen so many people open a store with the feasibility saying that they're gonna have 35 or 40% 40, 40 delivery in the zone. They don't take into account that now they're gonna cannibalize the rest of the zones around those units. So it comes into this, like I said, the study, square footage, what you're actually gonna materialize through your drive through what you're gonna materialize through your delivery, and then taking a look at your, your global strategy for covering a city and which zones are gonna be covered by which territories. Um, you gotta put it all together and make the right decision. That's, a, that, that's quite a great point, I think. Mm -hmm. Percentage bases the size of the restaurant. That's mm -hmm. a great takeaway for me. Uh, you know, moving on to another piece which is generally looked at as a top line uh, you know, mover, your customer acquisition cost, your marketing cost, and, you know, that generally, you know, is looking at acquisition of the new customers and average order value at the store they, brought, they bring in. What we have seen is that a repeat customer makes a higher average order value just because they're comfortable with the brand, they know they, know they want, what they want to eat, they also want to order more, and then there's an upsell you know, motion uh, that every brand should ideally have. What's happening with you on that? Because the upsell, the higher average order value, either by upsell or a repeat customer, I think straight healthifies your bottom line. It's not only your top line generator and may not be directly related to your marketing cost. How do you look at it? 
one of them? You. Oh, okay. Um, so basically, I'm, I'm very ambivalent towards upselling. It's uh, the traditional, hey, do you want to add an extra shot of coffee? Do you want to go large? Do you want to do this? I just don't like that uh, the approach. You have to design your menu in a way that you are offering the items that you actually want to upsell and have the proper margins. Um, but most importantly, go along with your brand story. They are authentic. They are paralleled to what your USP is. So I want to sell you this because this is what I stand for. This product is my signature product. It has all of the brand elements that I want to relate to the market and I want to persuade you to return for. And then you put that in your menu in a way that the server doesn't have to, would you like to try this? Would you like to do this? Would you like to add this? You don't want to do that. You got to get rid of that language and you have to have the, the server be able to tell a story around the product that you're trying to upsell that reinforces the consumer's bond to the brand. Yes. Yeah, I mean to, yeah uh, to answer you very briefly, yes, uh, upselling and repeat customers are revenue drivers, but those are two separate things. When uh, uh, the upselling, you have to be extremely careful, and we, uh, we discussed it with the sheriff, that not to overdo it, because mm -hmm. we've seen a lot yeah. of brands who, who over upsell to a point where they upset customers, and we don't want to reach this. Mm -hmm. There's a limit to how far you can exceed mm -hmm. when you want to upsell. Repeat customer on the other side is, I love this word, I like that this, this word because if you reach to a stage where you have repeat customers, it means that you have extremely well executed the strategy of moving your first customer to repeat customers. There is a lot happening to, to become, uh, to, to reach a stage where you have repeat customers. If you reach the stage, it means you have to sustain your repeat customers, you have to take care of your repeat customers because those are the customers who, are, who will contribute to your average. And you're looking at your marketing strategy, <coughs> what's the pick for you? Is it the upsell or is it repeat customers? Repeat customers. Is how do we sustain the pool of repeat customers we have today and how do we grow it further? It's very important. Digital marketing obviously is one way to make sure. Loyalty programs uh, is another way and you have uh, uh, many other ways. But to answer you shortly, it's repeat customers. Sheriff, um, uh, your views on for upsell? For me, it's th there are two different things. Um, we don't talk to them in the same topic. Uh, upsell for us is important. Uh, I, I tend to agree with both my colleagues. It's very important to make sure that when we do it, we do it to complement what the order, what the customer is ordering, not to just give, give them more, 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 upgrade, upsize, take dessert. Take si it, this becomes really annoying. And at a certain point in my previous uh, experiences, we discovered that sometimes when we overdo this, we change the perception of the brand when it comes in terms of value. Right. So if a consumer is coming in to spend 40 Saudi reals, this is what he expects to spend to have a decent meal, suddenly he discovers himself paying 50 or 55. Mm -hmm. And then this changes the perception that we are becoming a more expensive than what we used to be, while we didn't increase our prices. So it is very important to have a system for it and people to be trained with a little bit of logic. It, it is not a systematic thing for him to see what you're ordering and how can I complement your order, not just to upsell. On the other hand, our frequency for us is the most important thing, which is how to create a strong, loyal customer base. And this is what makes fundamentally why brand is successful. So for us, this is another topic that we address very differently through digital and through service and through everything, actually, and even how the menu is structured. So this is a very long story that I think we don't have time to go through now. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for all your insights. Uh, Sharif, Yunus, Matteo, this was a great session. Thank, thank you. you.